Thank you for being here today. The Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Haganya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs, which I chair, will now convene this roundtable informational briefing. For the record, in accordance with the open government law, public announcements, public notices were given to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets. The first notice was on Monday, June 24, 2019, and the second notice on Saturday, June 29, 2019. Today is Monday, July 1, 2019, and the time is now 1.06. Today, the committee will focus on discussions pertinent to the current version of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs, or Departmenten i Kauhau Guinehan Tomorrow, and its operational status. Joining me for this public hearing, we are very pleased to have Senator Pito Chirlahi here with us today. So thank you, Sidhuis Maasi, Senator. We will conduct today's discussions and briefings to allow us to understand the work completed by the Department of Tomorrow Affairs and the work that is in progress. The Department of Tomorrow Affairs has undergone considerable change this term and has evolved since the beginning of my term of this administration. So actually, it's undergone quite a bit of change in the last uh, few terms, and we'll, we'll cover some of that. The last administration under Governor Calvo, through his reorganizational advisory number six, on October 6, 2011, folded the Guam Public Library, the Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority, and the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agencies into this larger structure of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs. Now, since January 7, 2019, the following executive orders have been passed evolving the arrangements of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs. The executive orders are EO 2019-02. This separated the Hagatnya Restoration and Redevelopment Authority from DCA. EO 2019-03, separating the Guam Educational Telecommunications Corporations, also known as PBS, KGTF, also from DCA. The Executive Order 2019-14, which was issued more recently, separated the Guam Public Library System and the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. And there was further the Executive Order 2019-15, which created a Governor's Task Force on Tomorrow Heritage and Cultural Advancement to examine the status of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs and Guam Cultural Heritage Agencies to establish and develop recommendations to enhance their mission, operations, and effectiveness. The, Mar the Department of Tomorrow Affairs still has under its organizational umbrella the Guam Museum, Tomorrow Village, or Iseng Song Tomorrow, Research, Publication, and Training, Tomorrow Language and Culture, Guam Archives. As a result of Reorganization Advisory Number 6, passed in 2011, much of the functionality of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs was removed, which has led to the Executive Order 2019 15, that seeks to, through this task force, to re-envision, reprioritize, and strengthen the Department of Tomorrow Affairs in its mission and in its work. The inactive divisions of the Department of Tomorrow Affairs are the research, publication, and training, 
Chamorro Language and Culture, Guam Archives. The Department of Chamorro Affairs is an important government instrumentality in the preservation, development, and promotion of the Chamorro heritage of Guam for the public benefit and to provide specific services to the Chamorro people that are indigenous to Guahan and the Marianas Archipelago, looking at in a broader sense as well, and is intended that the Department of Chamorro Affairs be a catalyst in the preservation, development, and promotion of language, arts, humanities, historic and cultural preservation, research, restoration, presentation, museum activities, and support programs significant to Guam's history and culture, and to enhance the future of the Chamorro people of Guam. Today we will discuss the involvement, activities, and conditions of DCA. We will focus on the department's active components and wait upon the governor's task force that was created by Executive Order 2019-15 to submit its findings and recommendations towards enhancing and developing Guam's cultural and heritage components. Since a special session has been called at 2 p.m. this afternoon, I want to narrow our discussion and focus on the Department of Tomorrow Affairs. And, uh, for that reason, we have with us just uh, sitting here the Department of Tomorrow Affairs and uh, some of the people that uh, Gehelu and Marie has been working with. Let me go over just a few general rules for the roundtable informational briefing and then we will get to actually begin. <laughs> we hope everyone present at this table has had an opportunity to sign in for record keeping purposes. The conduct of this roundtable informational briefing shall be as follows. One, as the chair of the committee, I will preside, moderate, and facilitate discussion. Topics of discussion will be introduced based on the documents being reviewed. Discussion shall be confined to the substance. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone and to turn it off once you are finished speaking. So if you could introduce yourselves and state your name for the record, and then we shall formally begin. Hafide Gwaosi Anne Marie Arceo Gwahui Maskehelogi Department in Kaugunan Samoru. Hafide, I'm Jackie Babas and I'm the acting director of Kaha. Half a day, Teresita L.G. Kenmer, Library Technician Supervisor, Guam Public Library System. Half a day, my name is Jennifer Paulino. I, um, at, I'm, I come from Chamorro Village, and I'm program, program coordinator. Half a day, I'm Sherry Barcinas, Administrative Officer of CAHA, and also acting on uh, Department of Chamorro Affairs. Malik. We will now begin discussions for the roundtable informational briefing. So I thought we would start with understanding the state of things. Can you please explain to us the state of the Board of Trustees, which sits over the Department of Tomorrow Affairs, uh, letting us know if you have an impaneled board or where it's at in membership? Sure. Um, we currently have eight board members with one vacancy, and three of them have expired but we haven't had any appointees, therefore they're still active, and the rest of them don't expire until 2021. Okay, so you mentioned one vacancy, and you said uh, three members' membership uh, it has expired? Yes, uh, okay. in March. In March. However, there haven't been any appointments, and so they could still sit in to um, continue until someone, the three members are, or someone else is appointed. I see. So that's how we still have eight members and one yes. vacancy. Yes. Maulik. And along with that, there's another board that works with you. So if you could also tell us the state of the COSAS Advisory Board, which just for those that are less familiar, uh, so that people can understand that the Board of Trustees oversees the Department of Tomorrow Affairs and then 
the, that same board of trustees also oversees the museum alongside the COSAS advisory board. So if you could let us know the status of those members. There are, have been only two members appointed to the COSAS board and that's uh, Dr. Laura Souter and Mr. Simeon Palomo. And if you could refresh my memory as to how many members, um, are there supposed to be, I think, nine members, or is it five? Um, for now, there could be a maximum of nine, but I think we're trying to get just five on to have a quorum. There hasn't, um, they haven't been able to uh, establish that yet with just the two members, and so uh, I believe just communication between them has been happening, and so um, that is one of the short-term goals in this whole reorganization is to um, equip the board of the COSES with complete members so that we can, uh, especially for um, deaccessioning and accessioning for the museum, it's, uh, it's very vital in this process to have the board members to be able to um, uh, work on that. So do a for that. The museum has been newly uh, put back into our community, and so of course we're very excited to have it be fully impaneled uh, with the COSIS Advisory Board uh, as soon as possible, and for it to be able to be moving forward well. <coughs> I noticed that there were especially two memberships that stood out to me. One is that there's, uh, one of the members is to be a Sina, and one is to be Manhoban, or a youth. Uh, is anybody sitting in either of those um, positions, at least the sign of position? Are you talking about the COSAS board? Hungen. Hungen. Um, well, between the two members now, uh, I would say that Dr. Sauter will be the sign and Simeon, he's not a youth, but... Uh, <laughs> at heart. He's youth to <laughs> he's youth Dr. Sauter. <laughs> I guess, so the, those two represent for now, but still not enough for a quorum to move anything. Right, and um, just to, I guess, let people know that uh, somebody was very thoughtful in the way that they set this up to make sure that we have an elder leading the way or a, as part of this, but also to be making sure that we have some of the youth involved and thinking from their perspective as well. I want to mention that Senator Joe Senegastine has mentioned, uh, uh, excuse me, has joined us. So, Sidhuis Masi, Senator. <laughs> so, with the board members, um, I'd also like to look at the transition report a bit. There were actually maybe about uh, 10 pages of information or so uh, in the transition report. So, some of what they do in the transition report, they really highlight that the Department of Tomorrow Affairs is meant to be this catalyst. Uh, it's supposed to be just at the forefront of so many things for the people of Guam in general, and certainly the Tomorrow people especially. I want to mention, let's see, some of the other things that they highlighted. Um, one of the things that I've underlined here, and it's just uh, informational, but that when we're looking at the museum, uh, it struck me that it says that there are over 250,000 unique artifacts that are part of the museum uh, collection, as well as documents and photographs. So if you put all of that together, we have uh, quite a collection to serve the people of Guam. Um, now also in the transition report are priorities and recommendations. And so we see that one of the very first recommendations is to have that short-term Chamorro Heritage Task Force. And so we see that that's just recently been done. That uh, another recommendation was to move PBS Guam from under the umbrella, and that's already been achieved. That uh, listing as a top priority to promote Chamorro language and cultural practices, as well as uh, establishing a Chamorro language immersion and endangered indigenous language uh, list and, and programs. 
as well as for DCA to be supporting nonprofit tomorrow cultural programs. So uh, these are all very exciting things to see this, this group build on what we've had in the past and perhaps uh, make even more productive in the future. Now I do notice for Chamorro Village, there was a recommendation here to collect outstanding rentals of $40,000 that were due. Can you please provide us an update on where we're at with collecting that rent? Um, we've been di diligently working at that. Senator, uh, some vendors whom we've given chances to um, do promissory notices that weren't kept, and so we've actually removed some of them, you know, chances and chances over and over. So uh, uh, given that, even from the previous administration, you know, they've done promissory agreements that weren't kept, and so even just in my term, uh, um, I've given them, you know, uh, many chances to be able to recover in different ways. And so uh, some of those vendors have been removed with still outstanding debts to pay back. That's probably gonna have to go to collections, but at least they're not just, you know, in, in those spots taking up space. And it's not only in rent, but also in water. So um, water and rent expenses is what's due. And then some of them we've gotten to pay uh, you know, they owe up to even 10000 they've paid up so that they're able to stay because we, we've given them, you know, up to three notices. And I think the process that we've been through is very, very fair to give them a chance to recover or to eventually just concede and be content that they're not going to be able to make it and to move out. So um, we continue to collect those debts uh, in a, a due process you know, and fair way as much as we can, giving consideration, even bringing, carrying over from the last administration their debts, we're still giving them a, a fair opportunity. And so uh, up until their 90 days, uh, which is part of our policy, we have been giving them notices. And so from the 90 days, we start to begin to give them um, uh, uh, promissory notes again, if they will, and if not, then we just cut them in. Uh, we've been pretty successful with collecting these payments. Um, it's hard still because it's been allowed, you know, to, to uh, continue just piling and piling. And so, um, but we're trying. We're, we're, we're moving on that. Cesar Smasi. Malik, so it, it's good to hear that you've made this a priority, that you've collected uh, a certain amount. Do you understand where you're at in the collections? Um, are you about halfway through the collecting the 40,000 um, Hang on at this me. point? Do you think um, I, would, I would say, I think. Jen, I'd like to just say that Jennifer is, Jennifer Paulino is the program coordinator one, however, has been in the acting position. I've uh, uh, directed to uh, be in the acting position of general manager for the village in lieu of hiring a, a, a manager as we decide what we're gonna do with that and the move to Gita. Thank you. Um, I would, I would uh, say that yes, um, I think we probably had a total of five bad debts um, on taking care, I safe to say three we ha uh, that we have taken care of. There are two that are currently pending right now. And like Anne-Marie says, we go through the process and we give them the, um, the notices and, uh, and, and then we take it from there. But um, that is just in a matter of, of several months that we've done so far. Did any of the other senators have uh, questions about Tomorrow Village or those uh, payments? Uh, first off, I, I just want to thank all of you for uh, sharing this uh, moment with us. I'm just a little bit concerned because uh, we were talking about the... Uh, the um, the restrooms over there. Mm -hmm. And how do you divide the, uh, the outstanding debt that each of the vendors does have over there? Do you divide it by, by the number of vendors or do you prorate that by the number of whatever? So, so what we have um, based on the, the figures that we have for the monthly rental, 5% is what we charge each permanent merchant monthly for the um, Used to, use of the uh, the facilities and common area fees is what we call it. Yes. So so, um, 
if I'm not mistaken, we're, we have an outstanding debt of about $40,000. Uh, is that power and water or what is that? Um, that is, that's just basically rental, rental. If you're, if you're referring to the, the rental of the merchants, yes. And it should, it should be less right now. Like I said, we had um, about five and we've taken care of three and we now have about two. Okay, so you still debt. allow them to operate even though they have an outstanding uh, debt that they have to pay? Or how, how, how do you work that out? Do, do you make them uh, just continue to operate or do you uh, just uh, communicate with them and get a promissory note, whatever? Yeah, as much as we can, we, um, we reach out to them, we, we counsel them, and we do send them notices. We have first, second, and third notices. Now, if it's anything to go uh, over 90 days, then we, um, based on the rules and regs, then we can evict. So we have recently evicted several. I, I just want to add that I've been there a couple of times already, and I find that place to be really neat. I go into the restroom, I go in there, and it's, it's really neat. It's complete. You have uh, toilet tissues and things like that. The water is running and all yeah. that. So uh, I want to uh, I want to congratulate you guys for doing Thank a good you, job. Pito. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I've I've got a very general question to ask. The Chamorro Village setup. How is how is that set up? How are vendors allowed to participate, and what is the duration of time that they're allowed to participate? What is the what is the program that Chamorro Village has? I think that's what a lot of people would like to know. How, how is that set up? Well, I'll answer part of it and Jen can help me. But um, so there's, there's two parts. You could be a merchant, meaning you're, you know, you're renting one of the units at the Chamorro Village or a Wednesday night market vendor. And right now with the carnival taking place, a lot of those vendors have moved over to the carnival and they're renting with the carnival. So they're not even in Chamorro, but we, we don't, the, car, uh, the whole Festback hut, or I shouldn't say the Sagan Manainata hut, so we need to get used to stop saying, you know, u using that name. So that is the official name, is Sagan Manainata, not the Festback hut. So I know we've been, you know, uh, used to uh, saying that, but they, that's been turned over to um, the Carnival, to Liberation Committee. And so those vendors that are there report to them. But during Wednesday nights, non-carnival times, and those huts are also rented at least out on Wednesdays or on weekends or you know whatever occasions to just what we call vendors, meaning they're not permanently there, and they can come in and rent or you know apply for a stall, and those prices uh, vary from the regular merchant uh, rentals. Okay, let, let, let me go back to my question. What is the program? on how do you establish yourself as a vendor at Chamorro Village. How, does, how is it supposed to be set up? Because my understanding is that Chamorro Village is supposed to be an incubator yes, program. Yes. And there's vendors there that have been there forever. And I'm not asking you to move anybody out. Great. Mm -hmm. They're successful. Great. Mm -hmm. But you reach a point eh, in the incubator system that you should be able to reach out and, they, and, and the government should be able to assist them in finding another location so the next vendor can join. Yes. So and, and that's why I wanted to know is that how is the how is the program set up? Because I know of a lot of vendors that have said, how do we get involved? I said, just go and apply. And I said that for the past two years and for many years, and mm -hmm. that's all they're doing is they're hoping to get in, mm -hmm. but they're not getting in, and the same folks are there. Yeah. And all I'm, all, all I'm concerned about is that you have – the buildings that were built by Festback, driven by Festback, is now controlled by Chamorro Village, correct? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't see them having the same luxury as the rest of the other buildings have. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be included. And the reason why is because when anybody rents that, you don't generally have access to water. You don't mm -hmm. generally have mm -hmm. access to power. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 I've seen correct. the place, it's dark. And I'm like, you don't have windows, you don't have doors, you just have a... A coban. I mean, or you have a what that a, a gazebo or whatever you want to call it. It's a pavilion. And 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 how do you charge for a pavilion when I know your charge is probably a lot more than Parks and Rec's charges? Okay. Okay. And I'm just I'm very fine. concerned that everybody else would like to participate. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe that whatever is owned by Chamorro Village, 
should be controlled by Chamorro Village, not the carnival. The carnival has their own program. They should have had their own act together. But Chamorro Village is Chamorro Village. You guys have a program to run. There's people wanting to sell. All the tourism are down there. And I'm just concerned that how do you make it win? Because my understanding is that what Gita may take over, I don't know. And if they do, how is that going to be a win-win for all our merchants? That's what I would be very concerned about. Okay. So um, I can only account for the time that I've come in, in January to now, which is six months, which has been crazy for me. But um, with a lot of help with these beautiful people here, I wouldn't have been able to survive without them. So um, coming in, of course, being a, an advocate of going to Moru and going local, the first thing I wanted to fix, of course, was Chumar Village. So I began by a program where I knew these vendors considering and being empathetic of where they've been. And I know that you know the previous uh, uh, administration, or should I say the general manager, only brought it here because I, I was formerly a vendor at, uh, or a merchant at Chamorro Village. And I know how that ran is because of sustainability, they allowed you know, things to just come in and built the, Chum the Wednesday night markets, which has been very, very successful. <laughs> coming in now in my term, seeing and knowing the history, I believe that it's it was time to pull everything back into its original purpose. And that is to push local, to push local products. And so I've called, we've called numerous merchant meetings and vendor meetings to explain to them that, you know, what our, where we're driving and what our mission is gonna be. And so we set out with um, checking, you know, saying that, okay, uh, if you have so much uh, uh, merchandise, you have time to, to start to shift to this, start being creative, start. And so that was from one meeting and then the second meeting to check, okay, how are you guys doing? Are you shifting? Just so that we're not exactly pushing anybody out, but because it's been allowed in the past and have a fair, you know, due process for them to shift and make the change. And by a certain date, um, they should have, uh, by a certain date of checking and having an assessment going into the stores to see you know, if they're shifting their, some of them, we've made great marks and some of them shifting their names to tomorrow names and then entertainment. We have prohibited any kind of Polynesian entertainment or, you know, and trying to stick to just local tomorrow entertainment. Um, um, and we've given everybody a chance to make the shift given the auspices that they've been allowed to get used to, you know, running things this way. And so the last six months, we've been just having meetings, checking in with them, and everybody, you know, seemed, at least at the table when they came, they said that they supported it, and um, they asked, how are you going to do this? And so there were some gray areas, like, how could you possibly say it's local when we don't make, we don't have a factory for shirts here, so we purchase the shirts and then bring it to Guam, and then, you know, just some ideas, you know, who do we put a Guam thing on it? How about if it is it? Uh, totally available here in Guam. What's the you know supply and demand here of EFIT? And if they ordered it from Bali and put a Guam seal or a Laddie stone on it, how are we going to work all of that out? And so we've developed committees for both the merchants and the vendors for them to have a say so on the rules and regulations and make the recommendations to uh, to us. And so therefore, I'm not just making decisions on my own but taking it from what areas since they've been there for many years, what do they think? And so we've already established the rules and regs from that committee that all of the vendors voted for them to represent on this committee with Wednesday Night Market. And now we're just trying to close the merchants now, you know, having their meetings to talk about exactly how they're going to iron out the gray area of what is local and what is, uh, 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 you know, We've, ha we've worked with Gita coming to uh, assist the merchants and the vendors in doing uh, Guam-made products because they have a program there. And so they've educated them about being creative. And so we've done partnerships in that sense to help the vendors and the merchants to move in that direction that they haven't been used to. No? And then some of them are really, really driving local already. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place, but uh, that's what we've been working on. Uh, we've come to, you know, you see signage and things changing, being, you know, to, tomorrow, tomorrow rise, if you will, um, and the consideration of products and how they bring it. 
The merchant committee, like I said, is still working on you know, how to move about that. Now, as far as the incubator, um, I know that watching the history and, and just uh, um, studying with Jen, you know, how, where everything is at, I know that some of those, those uh, businesses in there are considered sustainable, the sustainable profit making, you know, they, they're the big chunk that's been sustaining the Chamorro Village. And so we've also been meeting with them. They're part of those meetings to make the shift, you know, um, to change, you know, for example, Jamaican Grill to Chamorro Grill. You know, we're making, we're giving them the options. Now, after a certain period of time with due process and having these meetings, and we're still continuing, we're not done yet, no, we're going into July. So another meeting will be called by July, um, minding the shift of the consideration that Chamorro Village is being considered by the administration to move to, to Gita. We'll continue with our process until, you know, we're told that we're, uh, DC is no longer in charge, but I plan to have one more meeting discussing, and they know because I've been notifying them since February was our first meeting, and it's going to be July, and we've been telling them you either need to make the shift towards the mission or else, you know, we need to talk about how long and, you know, uh, what justifies being an incubator and, and making room for these other artists that you say well, we need to move in. Even considering a program for um, consignment purposes where, you know, uh, these young artists that are coming along and we know that today there's a renaissance of art, tomorrow art that's growing. And uh, I am fully aware as the leader uh, of the Department of Chamorro Affairs that we need to begin to take care of these business proprietors or ent you know, uh, entrepreneurs who are coming up. And so making space for that, you know, there's many Chamorro restaurants that could actually move in to support the, 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 the uh, Chamorro Village. So they know and they're aware. And so you know, there's been un uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, discomfort. Well, you, you know, uh, what I was trying to get at, is it's not about enforcing the incubators program, okay? Mm -hmm. it, it was to find out exactly how was it set up. And mm -hmm. it's quite obvious um, the management of Chamorro Village lost its touch of what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not recommending to get, ask anybody to leave. Because mm -hmm. if you want to talk about Jamaican Grill, all the Chamorros go to eat the Jamaican Grill. I love Jamaican because Grill Because everybody too. believes that Jamaican <laughs> Grill is more Chamorro food than the word Jamaican. And if, and if you take a look around, mm -hmm. the only place I know of that actually would sell Chamorro food a lot mm -hmm. is Linda's. And Linda's is not going to come down to Chamorro Village. Okay, so we can forget about that. And, and, if, there, and if, there's a, if there are entrepreneurs out there that, that cook Chamorro food, well, then get on the list. Don't make the excuse and don't blame that somebody else is there. Okay? Mm -hmm. And, and all, the reason why I'm asking about that program is that if the incubator system is broken, then come up with a program and maybe designate a portion of Chamorro Village to be an incubator system. Yes. Not necessarily mean the whole thing has to be changed because you, it's almost impossible to change this overnight. Mm -hmm. No matter how the intention is good, mm -hmm. you can tell me it's, it's, it's a, a Chamorro t-shirt. Well, go to Kmart and you'll mm -hmm. find I love Finny Denny. Mm -hmm. You're not going to find that at Chamorro Village. Okay, so let's not beat this too much and let's just... If, if, if there are folks there that can make shirts, so be it. Mm -hmm. If you're registered, you're licensed, so be it, get in line. And okay. register view folks and say that maybe they want a spot on Wednesday only. Because a lot of these people are at every fiesta. They're at every event throughout the island. Mm -hmm. They probably don't want to be stuck at Chamorro Village every day. Mm -hmm. And the folks that you pretty much have down there are pretty much stable. I mean, when you want to talk about Jamaican Grill, well, let's talk about the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. A lot of Chamorros go there to eat fish. Or Nothing island barbecue. And so forth, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's all I'm saying is that it's kind of like figure out what the program should be, and then that's what you should propose. Yeah. Yeah. And all the Chamorros will join in because you have half of, the, half of the population that go down there on Wednesday night is Chamorro. Other half is tourists. The other half is mm -hmm. it's everybody. It's a melting pot down on, on Wednesday night and almost every night now. Okay, I just wanted to bring that up. Is that just figure okay, out what you want to do up. and then present it and then let's move. We are getting there. So in the last six months, um, given the debts and 
I tell you, I give honor to this woman sitting next to me because the daily problems down at Jamar Village just eat up operations every day. And even just to even implement programs, because right now all we've been doing is cleaning house. We're really cleaning house and trying to get the programs back to what originally the Jamar Village is made for. And that's taking a lot because, you know, we're dealing with vendors that have been there for a long time. We're dealing with a balance of sustainability. And so that's why the due process, the 90 days, the letters, and then eventually we're getting there. So one of the programs that we have begun to address already um, is turning, getting so the entrepreneurs that are small, the small business uh, uh, artists who are creating goods that are local products that cannot afford to actually rent even a space, an incubator space at Jamar Village and put them together in one stall, kind of like a consignment space so that they only pay one-fourth of the rent maybe or half the rent, whatever is you know, uh, affordable for them, and that they come together and share those products. However, um, uh, in trying to address the meetings with the merchants, we have to get through that first through that gray area so that before we commit again to more vendors that we actually have the program in place so there's no, you know, we're not taking them in and then we're changing everything as we go again and then the merchants have to deal with different rules and regulations. And so that's yep. basically where we're at right now. But I do hear you, sir. Yes. And so, so something, to consider, oh. something to consider as you get vendors, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, some vendors don't want to be there every day, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of trying to group them, find out what they're selling mm -hmm. and then get a percentage of their, what they sell. Maybe that might be a way to get them in the, in the net. I mean, because if you get one vendor that makes a bunch of sanais and they say, mm -hmm. we're only going to make $200 a day, well, then we'll get a percentage. Okay, maybe 10, 20, 30 percent, whatever percent. You're trying to get them in the door. So we've been meeting yeah. with a group of vendors, and that's one of the options. Okay, so we're good. saying either pay rent or give us a percentage. And there so you go. we're trying to come up with what's going to work for them, and yeah. we're exploring and meeting with the artists and these uh, entrepreneurs to see what are, you know, what are ways that will work for them before we yes. implement the program and then it just, we're setting it up for failure. So we, we've been having conversations with them, calling meetings with them to see how right. we can support them and what's gonna work win-win for both of them and the Chamor Village. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just Masi. Masi, to both of you, I think in, in many ways you guys are speaking the same language and you're on the same page. I really appreciate the suggestion that maybe uh, with this, this program, uh, a percentage of the Chamorro Village can be looked at as a more intensive incubator type program, and so that maybe gives you more flexibility. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate that you've been putting the time and attention into getting them caught up with their rears. So we're short on time today. Um, I just want to start the next topic, and then also in the transition report, there are audit findings regarding the management of the museum um, that the contractor had not deposited all of the FY 2017 revenues. And so what was reported here in the transition report is that 66,000 was uh, not, it had not been collected, although they are recommending plans to obtain payment. So could you please uh, update us on whether that payment was received by the contractor sure, sure. for the museum? So um, that was one of the first tasks before they um, were renewed uh, that I you know, um, uh, had to, to face is because this was from 2017 uh, audit finding. And so um, I'm glad to report that we have accomplished receiving the whole 66,386 and it was paid off on June 15, 2019 uh, in three installments. So that is done and complete for that audit finding. Malik, so your team has been really good in collections and that's very good to hear. Um, I believe there were other findings um, about the need to improve processes, um, you mentioned that the contract has been updated. So if you could tell us the purpose of that contract that's in place for this year, mm -hmm. uh, 
I'd like to just read it straight from the audit so I, you know, I don't make any mistake about how I'm, I'm putting it across. But uh, in the audit finding 2017-002, it states that revenues from exchange transactions should generally be accounted for at the time a transaction is completed. DCA did not find revenues in related receivables to the operations of the Guam Museum. So the recommendation on the audit plan was for DCA to consider implementing additional processes and procedures to ensure that records are obtained in a timely manner to support the amount recorded in its financial statements. Mm -hmm. Our corrective plan was since the audit operator has, made, has been made aware of finding and of the findings and have been submitting monthly reports for all re revenues generated in the past couple months as opposed to just turning in a spreadsheet. So um, we're accomplishing that monthly now. They're putting in uh, uh, you know, all the transactions, all the revenues received, and so we're accounting for that um, as opposed to, and that's just been happening uh, for the last two or three months, and it's uh, July, so, um, and they're updated with that. Sidhu so, Smasi, uh, can you briefly tell us about the contract, and then what we're going to do is uh, tentatively for July 17th, we're going to have a continuation for this uh, DCA roundtable, um, but can you talk about what the goals of that contract are for this year so that we can really understand the direction that DCA and the museum are going in? Sure. So um, uh, the original contract was um, supposedly uh, um, back then because the previous, from what I understand in, his, in, you know, uh, in a contract, it was made to actually be a transition to uh, until we got the government side got together for public management. And so that contract was put together uh, to be able to try to open the museum and Im immediately to meet um, opening for fest back. And uh, you know, wh so we don't have a wait period. And so it was established originally to, to uh, allow the government to get, to get its you know, um, business in order for public management. Now, uh, the, the contract was signed off for three years with two years optional to renew. They've done their three years. We've renewed them for a year and they still have an option to renew one more year, which will end in 2021. So with that contract, um, and you're working towards a transition towards public management, which I believe uh, will be a cost-saving measure, uh, can you explain the, the cost of the contract that we're paying on an annual basis and then um, how they're going to be helping you transition this year towards public management? Um, well, right now, uh, the cost of the contract actually uh, went down to instead of 100, uh, or they're, they're, I'm sorry, it's 110,000 a month that we're paying. So in a year, we're paying out $1.2 million to the contractor um, to operate the museum. Um, part of the contract was for them to transition this year, their optional year, to transition by training uh, uh, to, to prepare for public management, um, to get uh, accreditation of the museum to prepare for public management. And so uh, one, way or, one way or another, whether we renew or not for the second option, we do need to prepare for public management because even if we decide to renew the second option of renewal, we would still need to build at some point, we're gonna be still paying them out and hiring at the same time on the government side to prepare them because we can't just hire the day that the contract ends. So we need that transition period, which is all, part, uh, all said in the contract that there needs to be a transition period of training uh, into public management. So that's basically where we're at right now. And um, this year's contract will end on April 1st. This uh, for, uh, first renewal will end on April 1st of, two, of 2020. So just for that. And um, yes, it, it was for a certain number of years, so it was meant to be temporary. As you were saying, uh, we had FESPAC coming up and to get that functioning and allow time for the government to be building up its public management and public corporation. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I think there's still good ground to cover. I want to hear about uh, the visions that you have. I know that there is the Chamorro language section that we're wanting to be building up and some of those other sorts of programs. We're going to have to cut it short because of the emergency session. So I'll just announce again that uh, tentatively speaking, we'll go ahead and recess this and be looking at um, continuing this on July 17th, 2019 at 8.30 a.m. as our continuation date for the DCA roundtable hearing. So with that, um, we can still be receiving testimonies, uh, but we will be continuing this. So if there are any testimonies that people want to send in, please address written remarks excuse me, written comments to the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatna Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs by email to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or personally deliver your written comments to the second floor of the Guam Congress Building, 163 Chalan Santo Papa, Hagatna Guam, 96910. So do a to the senators. Sure. Because I think what I, what I would like to, uh, to put out is very important. And we did mention uh, that, uh, you know, board members are not complete. And that, uh, you know, remember now that uh, the board members usually, usually would put out the, the quorum. The Zangin Tikabal is not a board member. The Penfarma Martinez, this is Sean Perana Lamoli, this is Bishon Mizu. The Stabe Sangan, Molik Bidan Mizu, or Zangian Taza is a Mizu board, the Taza Quorum, Penfartina, this is Sean, then Tisina, Mangalantin, and Zuni Lamoli. Then Tinguana, Zangian Manguentusi put a policy, but half a son of this is Sean, Niponina Calantin, E. Actividan in Ninsegui, the Taza board. Pues sempre ti mega gay para ina na umizo. Pues sa zo fa fashion amzo da bay fashion amzo pago na tanis inisisario. Zangin sina na is a madam chair ni na ni sina in recommenda para fan member gi board. Okay, that the board ta Fernanda. What's the other one? Cosas. The advisory. The advisory board. The advisory member because amzo must move, na. Haji man man gaigi gi na sunia itumu esti afa para tatsogi pata bansa madidi di ikina lamtenta kumu sit bishotta gi gobenamento pues ejgi fa fashion namzu pago na ifan i chair ja gosmolik esti na chair sa kumu na ina sempi ja sumasano sempi i think i'm the i'm the co chair also right for your na yam ni ni nan the Tadago Watin Segidas Gi Gi Magastane Gi Gubetno. The Bericomenda no Matutuhune, Maricohi, Ezusiana Tauto, Isina Muna possibly of a member Gi Gi Board, the Puri, Ezgin, Asina Mas in Fatina's decision, Mizusa Zangin, Umfatina's decision, the Lacho, the Masha Hogu manager, no, but Hogu supervisor, the Lachi decision. Taigi i board pun puni naya bisu after mana pun sogi. Sudus masih. Sudus masih. Para bayi hu sudus masih nena na abisu hu ujungo na dinanti hafal lelakmu. Lo para be menti hak guni na gi executive order gi order eksekutibu. Lelaknya hak gui loku yane hak establisa i task force na maatan loku na para i komision fenut sumoru ezgi nanti insigiras. Man mangongone pat mana pupunta sa mahasu i task force po na studia mo as half a time mano siya dumanya i komisyon guatu gi i department ng kagunan sa moro ni pro aday todo stisya i kana tumilong na na punto na na responsibilidad at obligasyon at gi ilang nya i executive order unun ni para uin natin pues mentors matoto guya nao no gagay gya i i presenti na na manggehelo ni poro ina dadayham just sisinya habay fan aging hunters and quorum 
uh, illegal council might be said uh, to get Esther, you know, more uh, poor tent menunia. Sisinya ha man mamatina semantu sati ma pupunta o tru para Esdona na puesto. Siju smasi. Siju smasi for everybody here today, and I also want to mention that former Senator Hope Kustobo, who was also gehilu for the uh, commission if you know tomorrow, is here, and in attendance is also Arlene Santos. So, Siju um, Masi to everyone here. Thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again, perhaps on the 17th. Okay. Have a good day.